This meeting is now being recorded. All guests have been unmuted. All guests have been muted. Hello, everyone. It's Juanita Hartman. Can you hear me now? Yes. All Anita. guests have been unmuted. Okay. Hear you, Anita. okay, we are ready to go. I'm going to go ahead and mute you and we'll get started. All guests have been muted. Okay, welcome to our monthly technical assistance call. We are excited to share with you uh, how we are going to evaluate IFSPs moving forward. And in the room today, we have almost the entire team. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Amanda, who has introductions to make. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am super excited um, that we have, after a long, um, very difficult um, hiring process, we had a lot of really great candidates. Um, our candidate pool was, I know it put um, our hiring, our, I think our panel of interview panel, really to the test of finding the right person to bring on in the general supervision and data unit as our evaluation coordinator. And I want to um, welcome Ashley Kearney. Um, some of you may have interacted with her, worked closely with her, because she actually came to us from Developmental Pathways, and she will be supporting our efforts in compliance, monitoring, quality improvement. Um, as our TA call today is about self-assessment and looking at quality um, in IFSPs, she'll be taking on a lot of that um, self-assessment and verification activities um, and evaluation in the child and family outcomes. Um, so I do want to welcome her all. Um, we have her picture there, so you don't get to see her in person right now, um, and have her just in introduce herself really quick. Hello, everyone. This is Ashley. I'm really excited to start working with you all and getting into the role and start doing some good work. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Yay. Yay. <laughs> okay, we, we do have a few quick updates. Today, uh, I just want to remind you that you should have received a survey via SurveyMonkey uh, asking for information about who is conducting assessments for children with established conditions as well as who's um, completing the hearing and vision screening. So if you haven't already done so, please take the time to uh, complete that survey. I think we have 
uh, about 14 out of the 20 communities that have completed it already. So thank you. Laura, do you want to talk about the shared vision? Sure. I just wanted to give you guys a quick update. Um, we've been working quite a lot collaboratively with our um, with some newly available early intervention providers of vision services, the Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind and Anchor Center, to really make sure that everyone, no matter where you are, have um, a provider that can provide vision services. So I just wanted to let you know that we do have a new provider agency now. They're called A Shared Vision. Their sole focus is going to be home-based vision services for early intervention birth to three. For further information, you can contact, they're in the process of getting their office set up, but they are ready to take kids right now. And if you would like further information about them, contact Paula Landry or Stephanie Kirkwood. I talked with them yesterday and they said yes, even if you're outside of the metro area, you can contact them. They're really trying to work on um, how to reach out and make sure that every child has vision services between a combination of Anchor Center, our a shared vision providers, and the Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind. So you can contact them now. More information will be forthcoming. And this is Beth, and I just want to um, remind everyone that when you're filling out the health insurance authorization form, it's really important that all of the information be filled in, um, not just group number, um, but it's the subscriber number is a critical piece for the insurance companies when looking up information about a child. Um, and then there is an EI billing manual on the Medicaid website, and the website is there and how to, where to go to in order to get to the EI billing manual. Um, that was posted uh, just before the start of this fiscal year. And so as a result, uh, we no longer have the EI billing manual on the EI Colorado website. Okay, now we're going to turn it over to Ashley for some unicorn updates. All right. Hey, everybody. Ashley and I'm here. Yes, we have two Ashleys, and we did it on purpose to confuse everyone. <laughs> so first up, we I have a couple updates regarding um, the data system. So I want to do a first uh, a shout out for the three CCDs that were able to complete all of the required data by the November 1st deadline. And so this is the uh, fiscal year 15-16. We have... Verizon, Mountain Valley, and Community Connections. So congratulations to those three CCDs. They were able to get everything entered um, by November 1st. Hooray! Hooray! And then close second, we have North Metro, the Resource Exchange, Colorado Blue Sky, Eastern, and Envision. So all of those CCDs right there were able to get in the required information within the next day or two. Yay. So, Yay. Congratulations. Yay. so for fiscal year 16, 17 data cleanup, we're going to do things just a little bit differently based on how 15, 16 went. So each CCB is going to fall into one of four categories, and this is based on um, the size, the amount of missing data, um, and I believe there was one other determination on the next slide. So I'll go over that. So. The categories are, there's the blue category, so this is for CCDs that need minimal reminders when data is due. We have the green category, which is for CCDs that will be reminded on a quarterly basis to enter uh, data for fiscal year 16-17. Orange is for CCDs that need monthly reminders, and red is going to be for CCDs that need weekly reminders to enter missing data. So the categories that the CCBs fall into, they're not permanent. Um, CCBs can move up a category and they can certainly move down. So again, the determination is based on the timeliness of entering data, the size of the CCB, and the amount of missing data. So future unicorn TA calls. 
Currently, we do the unicorn TA calls on the last Monday of every month. Um, just due to how short the calls are and haven't really received a lot of requests on topics to go over during these calls, we are going to be placing the unicorn and TA calls on hold indefinitely. Any updates that I have, I'm just going to piggyback them on to this TA call. If a separate call is needed, it will be scheduled regarding updates to the unicorn. I will also send out an email reminding you guys. So, closed eligible versus closed not enrolled. I'm going to turn this over to Amanda. Hi again, everyone. Okay, so you should have received a communication brief regarding um, closed statuses um, indicated in the EI data system. Um, and I know that Ashley also went over um, these closed eligible, closed not enrolled reasons on her um, most recent unicorn TA call with some guidance that said that they might, there might be some changes. Um, so there were a little, a uh, couple clarifications, um, and that should be evident and is clear in the communication brief as it is on um, on the screen, and um, what what is happening is the reason that we are making these modifications to the closed eligible and the closed not enrolled reasons um, was definitely part of this was in as we're doing our cleanup in the data system that there was some confusions in the closed eligible, closed not enrolled reasons, maybe a couple inconsistencies in some categories that really just did not make sense. Um, so making sure that we're, they, we reformatted where they where they fall as appropriate. Also in alignment with um, what we receive from the U.S. Department of Education. So when we report our exiting data, um, we follow under the same categories that is designated by um, the, the feds. So they sent out a communication in September of 2016, and we are now aligning our data system and our, our reasons um, with the reasons that they're indicating. So it should make it easier for us with our 16-17 data um, as we are sending these up and making sure the alignment um, is appropriate. So you will see a couple of changes. Um, the most notable is we're adding in um, or we're redefining the withdrawal by parent for any family that is a closed eligible reason. So that's this withdrawal by parent, if you're closed eligible, is after eligibility has been determined and or an ISSB has been developed. So you'll see a secondary drop down. If you choose closed eligible withdrawal by parent, there will be a required field that you have to indicate one of the options below, which is either declined ISSP, declined part C services in whole, or completed ISSP. So you'll see that the completed ISSP, it kind of lived on its own by itself, so now you're seeing that it's falling under withdrawal by parent. So that is a notable change. Um, the second is um, that we tried to make closed eligible, closed not enrolled, attempt contact unsuccessful a little bit more clear. So there was one, one had a reason of um, parent not responsive, another had incomplete um, or that they were unable to contact um, was unsuccessful. So we made that consistent across both closed eligible and closed not enrolled reasons to align with the guidance from the U.S. Department of Education. So you'll see that attempt to contact unsuccessful may be a lack of response or an inability to contact or locate a family. So there, um, there's multiple reasons that can, that can fall. You may have originally contacted family, there has been a connection, and then yeah. they're not responding. Or it may be that you have tried to respond and your attempts are to no avail and have never had contact with a family. Um, so both of those reasons will fall under the, the bucket of attempt to contact unsuccessful. And Ashley has updated the, um, the EI data system unicorn user guide, and it has a couple other examples in there um, that will help further clarify. So in addition to that, um, one additional action required is we are now tracking number of attempts to contact a family. Um, so this is going to give us, as it was explained in the communication brief, um, a little bit more insight into your processes at the CCBs um, on what's happening and how many times. We want to know if more, more attempts to contact have any relationship to a family completing eligibility and seeing it through in the EI, um, in EI services. Um, so you will be required, if you choose attempt to contact unsuccessful, um, to indicate a number in a drop-down of number of attempts to contact a family. So if you have any questions, you need clarification, um, please reach out to myself. Um, or Ashley Ness, and we can um, 
help you if you need that. Are there any <coughs> questions? Nope. Difference between declined IFSC and declined Part C. All guests okay, have been I unmuted. Um, so I see that you have a question. What is the difference between declined IFSC and declined Part C? Um, and that's another question I think that was posted in the chatter as well. Um, and so the difference between declined IFSC and declined Part C is declined Part C would be under the closed eligible reason that a family has completed an evaluation. Oh, sure, hold on just a second, Tracy. I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone or mute, mute everyone so that we don't get that. All guests have been muted. Okay, and I'll turn it back on in a second. So declined Part C would be for a family that has completed an evaluation has been determined eligible based on at least one area of significant delay from the CCD um, and has not moved on. They have not completed an IFSP. Um, so it would be they're eligible, family is declining Part C services entirely. They do not want to continue on to have an IFSP meeting um, and have not gotten to the, the, the point that they have developed IFSP. So you have declined IFSP if you have a family that has completed, they, they, they've done the evaluation, they are determined eligible, you have had an IFSP meeting, um, parents have been participating in that, and at the point maybe at that IFSP meeting, they're, they're declining the IFSP at that point, so they do not agree with it, um, and then you indicate declined IFSP, and that's the reason they're exiting EI services. And then um, declined IFSP would also be used on any subsequent IFSP at that point. Um, so really the declined Part C is really just at that point that they are eligible and they um, have not developed that IFSP. Um, can we have that defined in parentheses? I know that um, it's, I, this has been defined in the user guide, so there are examples. Um, I know that there is also a character limit in the data system itself of how much information we can put in that dropdown. Um, yeah. yeah, there is a limit on how much information we can enter um, in the data system. Um, so, Jenna, to your question, is there ever a time when a family is eligible for Part C and has an IFSP meeting and does not move forward? Um, so that would be the example of that they decline the IFSP at that point. So really we're using that withdrawal by parent, declined if there has been an IFSP developed that a parent, um, either at that initial IFSP, it's developed and they're declining at that point, or any IFSP after. So if there has been an IFSP developed, they are in EI services and they choose not to accept it or consent, they're declining the IFSC at any point that they're in EI um, with us, that's when you would indicate that declined IFSC reason. Um, and all of this information should be reflected in the updated user guide. Of course. Any other questions on um, closed eligible, closed not enrolled exit reason? Okay. Okay, we're going to go ahead and leave you muted because we're getting a lot of feedback. So if you think of a question, go ahead and put it in the chat and we will make sure we answer it. Thank you, Amanda. Ashley? Okay, believe it or not, it's the end of 2016 and it's Time to start thinking about 2017, which means the final Go For It cohort for those of you that have not implemented an integrated IFSP child outcome summary process, it's time to begin thinking about that. So someone from the EI State team will be contacting your CCB shortly uh, with a plan to assign you a team lead from our team and, and think about uh, implementation activities. So what you can do now is to make sure that you are communicating within your community to your partners. So child find, um, your early childhood councils, early Head Start if you have them, uh, providers that you intend to integrate your IFSP and child outcome processes in the upcoming year, 
think about who within your CCB can take on the lead role for implementation activities and think about what training uh, your CCB is engaged in and make sure that you have the required training and activities uh, up to date so that, that you're ready to hit the ground running. We're going to really tighten up the timeline in this, this final year of implementation. So we anticipate that we will begin as early as January and do a staggered rollout with the, the remaining eight CCBs uh, beginning from January on. So we will be uh, contacting you about that. Okay, so now we want to move into IFSP self-assessment. And as part of our uh, quality initiatives that we identify through the State Systemic Improvement Plan, or the SSIS, which hopefully you're all familiar with by now, CCBs are going to be partnering with the state to engage in self-assessment activities and this is going to start with go for it communities. Cohort 1 has already undertaken some of this work and this will continue. Um, it's really focusing on family assessment activities, the global outcome ratings, and IFSP outcomes. So what you can do now is you can really begin to look at the quality of your practices in preparation for future self-assessment that will occur when you are part of the go for it um, work. So EI directors, service coordinators, supervisors, program managers should be looking at IFSPs on a regular basis if you're not already to check for quality practices. And we, we know that within your communities that, that you have been doing that, but now that we have the unicorn, and we can look at IFSPs in real time, it's much easier to be able to do that on a regular basis and identify uh, what a quality family assessment should be looking like in addition to the IFSP outcome. So that's, that's how you can plan and prepare uh, moving forward. So what am I talking about when, I, when I'm asking you to look for quality? So, some of the minimal expectations we would expect you to be looking at is that there's evidence of family, a family-driven process reflected in your IFSP, that the IFSP is free of spelling, grammatical errors, that jargon is avoided, and that it's, it's really family-friendly, strength-based language throughout the entirety of the IFSP, that all the sections that are required are completed, and that the IFSP outcomes are routine-based. So those are foundational pieces that we are looking for. So now we're going to look at a real IFSP that we identified from one of our go-for-it communities. And this IFSP was chosen, chosen because it's been through the self-assessment and verification process through the state. And it has a really pretty good family assessment that has been conducted. <laughs> it has some challenges in other areas, and we're going to show those to you as an example. And then we're also going to show you as uh, how we can adjust the IFSP <laughs> to improve um, the overall quality of the of the example to meet what we're calling acceptable criteria for a high-quality IFSP. And we use the term acceptable here because it's aligning with the self-assessment tool that's going to be shared with you later on the call. And that's, that's how we're going to identify um, quality of IFSPs moving forward. And Amanda's going to talk about those categories here in a bit. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Wayla here, and she uh, she has posted all of these handouts uh, on the EI Colorado website for you, so you have this PowerPoint and you have this IFSP and the associated materials. 
Hi, everybody. This is Layla. So we just uh, wanted to start here with this evaluation and assessment results page of the IFSP. And remember, like Lenita said, this is a real IFSP. Um, this is a screenshot of um, the adaptive, cognitive, and communication. Now, you can see, if we're thinking about the quality that Lenita mentioned previously, um, you know, up at the top, the very first line, it says, he uses utensil. So that is like, is, is that, is that really grammatically correct? Is that, is that something that we want to provide for families? Just looking at little things like that, um, those are pretty simple things to fix. And so, uh, making sure that you're thinking about those things. Um, communication, you can see, has got splinter receptive. So that's pretty jargony. So we want to make sure that as we, are looking at these kinds of things that we want to make sure that um, that we're meeting quality in all areas. Now you can see from this example that um, Jack, this is what we've named this uh, little boy Jack, um, that he has a significant delay in communication and so that's what causes him to be eligible for early intervention services. And um, just just to remind you, this, this um, IFSP that we're looking at is from a go for it community. And so it doesn't include the present levels of development. That's um, sort of the global outcomes page is sort of taking the place of that. However, you can still look at your IFSPs for quality, even if you are not a go for it community yet. So um, don't let that stop you. And let's go ahead and go to, I'll go to the next slide. And so this is just the second half of the evaluation and assessment. Now you'll notice that under vision and, and hearing, it says not applicable. Um, we really wouldn't expect to see that. We would, if, if this was an initial, certainly we would see it. But even if it was a periodic review, um, we would still want to see what had happened in the past regarding vision and hearing. Um, it's especially important since Jack has a significant delay in communication. This is just to show you the, um, the evaluation results from this community. Okay, let's move on to the next, um, the family assessment. So um, we're not going to take time today to read all of this, but we did, we did find that this family assessment really did contain quite a lot of information and it was very good. It was, um, it had a detail about each of these routines. And one thing that we um, really liked was that it had the satisfaction ratings. And um, I put circles on them, we'll see if those will come in. So they, they had a satisfaction rating for at home, and they also had a satisfaction rating for the uh, child care center, the, the daycare that the child was in. So um, this is this is a we thought of 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 an acceptable family assessment. And again, we're using that term accept, acceptable because that's what we're striving for. And and of course, we're striving for best practice. Um, but for now, we just want to make sure that things are really looking in the acceptable area. Um, the, Laura's going to talk a little bit later about the times when you might want to ask more questions during the family assessment based on the child's delay. And then the next slide um, is really just a continuation of the family assessment. You can see that this family assessment has a lot of great information, and um, that's why we chose this IFSP, because we felt that this was a, a really um, a good family assessment that we could work with. And then we have one more slide. This is also a family assessment. Again, you have these materials that you can take a look at if you want to read them. I know they're a little bit difficult to read on the screen, so that's why we put them as handouts on your uh, on the EI Colorado website. So the next page in this IFSP that we reviewed is the concerns, priorities, priorities and resources page. And this was really where we saw a breakdown in the quality of this IFSP. It, it was like they did the family assessment, they got a lot of great information, and then they turned the page and they said, okay, now what are your family's concerns? And had the family answer that question. When really they had gone through the whole entire day 
and had really identified several things that were concerning. So there really wasn't necessary to ask a new question at this point. And that's one thing that we're really um, working on in our training, um, making sure that we're not asking a new question when we turn the page. We're, we're calling this, um, we're using the idea of threading the information through. So when we're, when we see something in the concerns, we should have already seen that previously in the family assessment information. Same thing in the priorities. In fact, the priorities should come directly from the family's concerns. We did like that the, that this IFSP listed some of the family supports and resources, and so that was a great thing about this IFSP. So, Wayla, it, so we knew from the very beginning that the concern was in communication. That was identified in the evaluation, that language and communication was the area of delay. And then when you travel through and you look at this family assessment, that didn't guide the conversation at all. And while we, we do want to talk about the family's day and within routines, it would be appropriate to go back and talk about how communication is impacting these areas of the day and what communication looks like. And that wasn't reflected really anywhere uh, or very rarely in the family assessment piece. So we, that's what we're talking about threading is that we're pulling the information that we receive from referral and intake and the family's <coughs> initial concerns, the evaluation, then that's framing and guiding the family assessment. Absolutely. So um, it's a great point, Lenita, to make sure that we're really looking throughout this entire IFSP that we're seeing those themes travel through. And um, we, you know, frankly and honestly, as we've been reviewing IFSPs, we haven't been seeing that. Um, and so that's why we're doing this call today, because we want to really help you to see how that can really be um, threaded throughout. And it can make your IFSP meetings shorter, because you've already heard the information. You don't have to repeat something new or come up with a new answer to the question. <laughs> And so we're going to go to the next page in the IFSP. Now, in the Go For It IFSP, the next page is the Global Outcomes page. And so Lenita is going to talk about that. Thank you, Wayla. Okay, so this page might not be familiar to some of you on this call today because this, at this time, is only used by Go For It communities. Uh, However, it, it replaces the present levels of development and it gathers the same information. It's just structured in terms of strengths and needs instead. And this example shows the child outcomes ratings as well as the strengths and needs for Jack. And you can't see the rating here on the screen, but in all three global outcomes in this original example, uh, Jack was uh, given a rating of all skills expected, or for those of you that um, are still using numerical ratings, that would be a rating of a seven in all three areas. And so that was actually a red flag to us that um, he was given a rating of a, a seven in all three areas, and he's receiving early intervention and has a delay in communication. And so right there, we knew we needed to, to, to look at that. So I want to talk a little bit about why, uh, why else this is an unacceptable example of the global outcomes piece. Uh, part of it is because some of the strengths and needs are not in the global outcome that best represents the skill or behavior, and I'll point those out to you here in a little bit. And some information is inaccurate or doesn't uh, it doesn't reference back to the information already collected as part of the evaluation and family assessment, that threading through piece. Uh, the other piece is that we would never expect to see on a global outcomes page in the needs area uh, no concern, because all children have a, a next developmental uh, step uh, that they can go to. 
Now, this is a good example because there is enough information overall to give us a picture of where Jack is functioning in relation to other two-and-a-half-year-old children, and it's generally uh, strength-based, and it's also in family-friendly language, so it's, it's pretty robust. Uh, and it does pull information from the evaluation as well as from the family assessment. So it does have some strengths as well. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Laura. She's going to walk us through the next part of this example. Hi, everyone. And the coughing you've been hearing in the background is me, so I apologize if I have some coughing in the middle of this. So the next step in the IFSC, of course, is to move towards developing outcomes in the Child and Family Outcomes and Plan of Action page on the IFSC. And this, when we assessed it, we deemed as an unacceptable example of an outcome for Jack to increase his vocabulary that is age expected. So while this does broadly reflect the concerns of the family, it really doesn't reference back to the concerns that were identified in routines during the family assessment. They clearly talked about some areas in which Jack's lack of communication was impacting their day. Also, let's look at the next step in the <clears throat> IFSP process, which would be um, the measurable criteria, okay? So where are we starting? <clears throat> um, it should reflect all the information we know about Jack. Remember that weaving through or threading through of information, um, <clears throat> which isn't identified um, in this e example. You don't have a daily routine identified, and an outcome should identify a daily routine. It also uses jargon, vocalized five action or nouns related to the activity with this caregiver. A specific, a specific routine that had been identified during the family assessment by the family should be included here. Strategies are also nonspecific and they use jargon. The family should have specific examples of how they can support Jack, including when those strategies might fit within their day, such as, when at the park, name each thing that Jack picks up and encourage him to repeat the word. We learned a lot, actually, about the fact that they like to go to the park in the family assessment, so that would be a great opportunity to embed some strategies within that activity. We do think that the global outcome address is appropriate, <clears throat> taking action to meet his needs, because it's about him wanting to communicate his needs and wants to his family. So, Laura, we do have a question in the chat that okay. I'm going to read out since we are recording this call. So, Pat's asking, she's had some conversations post-family assessment with families where the parent repeatedly says, no, I don't just want little Jimmy to talk during that routine. I want little Jimmy to talk throughout all our routines. I try to dig deeper and ask how that would help little Jimmy participate more in all his routines. And the parent has looked at me like I'm not hearing them. Do you guys have any thoughts on how to navigate that? Yeah, I think that um, one of it is reflecting back, and we'll talk about this more in the next session, reflecting back on the concerns that the family has identified, that you've identified during the family assessment. Things where you see um, the family is struggling because Jimmy isn't talking. Families are always, of course, going to say they want their child to talk throughout the day, and you're going to be working on that. What we're doing with the outcome is just choosing one time, the most important time to them for Jimmy to be able to communicate what he wants, and then reassuring them that, of course, we're going to be implementing strategies that are going to help Jimmy talk all the time. <laughs> And I think you'll see this more as we talk through Jack's next example, because this is his delay in communication. So you'll see some strategies for that. So that was the actual IFSC, just as it was written, that went through the self-assessment process. So we wanted you to look at that and look at the things that were good about this IFSC and look at the things that didn't meet acceptable standards. So now we've taken that IFSP and we've adjusted it in a way that would meet the quality standard of acceptable. 
And we realized that this is sort of an artificial situation because, of course, we didn't have the family here to do this. But um, we wanted to show you sort of the things that we're looking for as we go through this uh, assessment process. And as we look at this, um, notice that we're using the same information that was gathered during valuation and a family assessment. And then we've changed it, and this IFSC would then meet acceptable and, in some instances, best practices quality criteria. So the first thing we're going to look at is how are we threading through the evaluation information to the next step of the process, which is family assessment. So as Juanita talked about earlier, we know Jack has a significant delay in communication. So we need to think about that during family assessment. We're probably going to want to ask some follow-up questions about how Jack's communicating during that time of the day. That'll really help us thread the information through the next step of the IFSP process. We don't want it to be two separate things. Oh, yes, Jack has a delay in communication, and this is what the day of the family looks like. We want to know how does Jack communication delay present itself within the life of the family. So we'll ask more about how Jack communication communicates as we learn about the day of the family during the family assessment. <clears throat> One other thing that I think people are confused about is that the family assessment really tells you about areas of the family's day that are concerning, regardless of how they rate it in the satisfaction rate. And on the next slide, you're going to see the same family assessment you just saw previously, but we're going to have the areas that seem concerning highlighted. Generally, this is what the facilitator would star during the family assessment. And you'll notice that it isn't related to the satisfaction rating. We are going to highlight things that are concerning whether they're in a highly rated routine or not. So take a look really quickly, if you are able to look at this in a, big, in a bigger font, at the routine of waking up. We know Jack has a delay in communication, so we could have asked how Jack lets his family know that he's awake. And also during feeding and mealtime, it says Jack babbles. Well, we could have asked how more about what that looks like. It also says Jack points to indicate what food he wants. We want to know, does Jack make any noise along with the pointing to indicate food? We need more information about how Jack communicates. Now, we're going to think about all other areas, too, how he's engaged and what he's doing independently and how he interacts with others around here, but we're not going to forget Jack has a delay in communication, and we need more information about that. And so Pat has another question, Laura, and she says that, um, that another challenge that she has had sometimes with families who seem to be a little bit offended when asked about the challenges within the routines of their day, and, and may, it maybe it's like they're taking it personally, or maybe they really feel like their routines are all easy. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, you run into this a lot. Families tend to write, actually rate their routines higher um, because they want us to know that they're capable of supporting their child and they've got it figured out. That's why <clears throat> when we get to the concerns and priorities page and we document all these things that we've written down as challenges, we talk with the family to say, these are things I heard you talking about that may be challenging to you. Let's go through them and you tell me if they're concerning or if there's something you'd like to change. So that's a way of saying, not saying, I identify these concerns for you, but saying, I heard you say this, now let's talk about it and you tell me if this is something you'd like to change or as a concern of you, yours. I've actually never had a family not identify anything when you ask them that question, if you've really got a good list of concerns and you don't just turn the page and ask the question again. Does that help? We're going to, we're going to, um, we're going to move on, and um, but we can we can talk to you more um, individually about that too as well because we want to make sure we're getting um, through our material here. And another thing that you can ask during the family assessment is, 
is there anything about that time of day you would like to be different? You can ask that right during the family assessment, even if it's rated highly. And generally, families will say, um, well, maybe this. Sometimes they'll say no, but you, sometimes you'll get good information there, too. <clears throat> so you'll see that concerns are identified by the highlighted areas, even in routines that the family entered uh, rated highly. <clears throat> So we've continued to highlight things that we heard that may be concerns of the family. So remember that may be concerns of the family. There are things we heard that were like, hmm, that sounds like that might be challenging for the family. Then we check in with the family during the next step of the IFSP process to determine whether the family identifies those as concerns. So I hear some people saying, but we're, that means we're identifying concerns with the family. No, you're just summarizing things that you heard during the family assessment, and then the family is telling you whether or not those are concerns or things they'd like to change within their day. And so this is uh, the next page on the IFSP, which is the concerns and priorities page. And again, just like we said before, we're not just turning the page and asking a new question. We're really just going through those those uh, highlighted areas in the family assessment or start or however you want to do it yourself. And um, we've checked with the family. Is this something that you'd like to see differently? Now, so, now something that we took out, one thing that we highlighted was that um, Jack always chooses his swimming trunks for his clothes. And so we decided that the family said, oh, we don't care about that. That's, that's fine. We, we're, that's all right. So we didn't write that down in this section. Um, so this is, those are the things, you just want to write down the things in this question pretty much exactly from the family assessment. Of course, you can summarize because you don't want it to be as long as the family assessment, obviously. But you can write those things down um, that the family would like to see change, something that's uh, difficult or that maybe they'd like to see something different. And then you can see in the next column by the arrows that we asked the family then what, of, of all of those things, if there was something that you could change, what would that be? Um, or what would make the biggest difference for your family if that were to change in your, in your day? And from that, then they can decide what they want to see happen differently. And you can see how those priorities are directly related to the things that we wrote. And we can coach them with that. We can say, um, I heard you say that this was a really difficult time of day for you. Is that something you'd like to see different? And um, so we we chose the priorities of for Jack to sit in his high chair, not throw food, eat different kinds of food, and then also that she would like to be able to take him in the car places without him screaming and crying. And then um, she mentioned a couple of times that she didn't know what the – um, child care uh, time looks like during the day, and so we listed that as a priority as well. Um, again, we have the, the resources that the family had. Okay, so Sue, I, I believe you're asking this page is not from the original IFSP, but what it, what it could have included, right? So we made adjustments to show you how we could improve this IFSP based on what the family assessment was telling us and and what we would move into concerns and priorities uh, based on that. So the important thing to notice is we didn't change anything up to this part. We're using the same assessment inf evaluation information and the same assessment information. We just want to show you how you can really get the quality with that same exact information. Right, and using that concept of threading it through so that we're seeing the same thing that we already saw and heard. Right, and so when we're hearing a lot about, gosh, these things are taking so long, family assessment's taking a long time, then we've got to do, you know, the development of the IFSP and the child outcomes rating, it's not a new process. It's, it's a process that's continuing. So you should have the information you need, and you're building on that. And we did have to make some assumptions, obviously, since we didn't have the family here, but um, we made those based on what the family said in the family assessment. Right. How we could have improved this even more is if we used the guide, the guidance of the evaluation and the concerns 
to help us with the family assessment and include those questions about communication, which really didn't happen too much right. as part of this. And, that, and that's why we say you really should get all the information you need from the family assessment, because that's really predicated on the fact that we should have taken the information from the evaluation and contextualize that within the day of the family during the family assessment. Right. So one of the things that we, we heard in the family assessment is that Jack is really having a difficult time in the car and is really sad and, and isn't really able to express um, why he's upset and isn't able to calm himself when he's on car rides. And so this was not threaded through. Oh, we didn't see this reflected in the global outcomes. And so when this, this child was given a rating of all expected skills in positive social emotional skills, um, that really didn't reflect the fact that he does have a need in this area and uh, needed support. So I adjusted this outcome rating to be many age expected skills. And that's what's highlighted here because he does have um, some age expected skills, but he also has some immediate foundational skills, uh, emerging skills for his age. And then I just want to quickly highlight that I moved a few items from positive social emotional skills, so global outcome one, into global outcome two, acquiring and using knowledge and skills. So um, he's just starting to use two word sentences. He's not yet singing phrases of songs. Um, and he's uh, engaging in some make believe play. So those were, were moved into the correct outcome area. So that's something you can do as part of your uh, self-assessment, and that's going to be pulled from both evaluation and also uh, family assessment. And so this global outcome area, global outcome three, it was also noted there were no um, concerns. However, um, they did note that he was not yet climbing into the car or car seat on his own where the family assessment clearly said he was doing that. So cross-checking information to, to make sure that it's, um, that it's correct. So we have a question from Tracy Lopez. Will the global outcomes area print from now on? Um, that is a bug that I logged this last week, so I will um, check up on that to make sure that it is printing. Thank you, Ashley. Okay, so now we're going to quickly move on to Laura and what we're going to do with all this information. So here you go. Here is our revised IFSP outcome, okay? So the only thing that you see that's similar to the previous one is that Jack could, they, mom said Jack could, wanted, she wanted Jack to say he wanted kick. Once again, we're not turning the page and asking you questions. We're continuing to thread the information gathered about the family's priorities through when we're developing the outcome. So here's the differences I want you to note. One, the priority exactly reflects what was identified by the family. Then when you go down to the, uh, the broad IFSP outcome, it reflects how the family would like the routine of mealtime to be different. The next thing you go to is where you're starting. And this clearly shows what the routine of eating looks like now for his Jack and his family. You don't need to gather new information. One thing that we found on every page of the um, after the family assessment of the original IFSP was that new information was being gathered. You're just reflecting. You're always reflecting, not gathering new information. The next thing, how will you know the IFSP outcome can be achieved, which is the measurable piece, is understandable to the family. The change in the routine can clearly be seen, and the measurable criteria is based on the progress that the IFSP team feels is accomplishable in a specific time frame that will move Jack closer to accomplishing the big, broader general outcome. The next thing that's different is the strategies are clear and understandable by the family and, when appropriate, reflect the time of day that the family can practice that skill with Jack just like the example I gave you earlier of Jack naming items when they're on the playground. So <clears throat> that's how we change the IFSP outcome page. Okay, 
So I apologize. I, I know we're going to run a little bit over today, but we really want to move into what this is going to look like as part of the self-assessment and verification stage of this work. So I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. Alrighty. So I do want to reiterate, knowing that um, the purpose, of, this is the main purpose of our call is really to start getting everyone thinking about quality, um, and knowing that even though Go For It communities are the first communities that are going to be doing the self-assessment and verification activities and using um, our self-assessment tool and then the state verification, um, but really getting you thinking about how you can start working on this now, even if you are not going to be utilizing um, the self-assessment tool. So as it is, and I know Lenita had already um, explained that this is part of our ethics, it is moving us into kind of our third component, which is evaluation. Um, and then our, our foundation of that is our self-assessment and a state verification using a self-assessment tool. Um, so just to describe what those two different activities are, kind of high level, the, C, the, the CCB self-assessment, um, and the reason for that is we're looking for a common criteria for examining IFSP and outcomes quality. Um, and what that is is applying a quality rating score to quantify and analyze IFSPs. So we know that it is challenging because you are writing these really robust IFSPs to provide families and working on um, their IFSP um, child and family outcomes. We want to see all of our kids and our families succeed, um, but we do want to try to quantify that so that we can apply a quality rating so that if we were to review any given IFSP, either you would review it yourself or at the state level, um, we would know and be able to um, identify which are quality um, based on a score. And then we also want to build local capacity um, so that you can monitor for quality um, of IFSP and child and family outcomes. Um, and that's the purpose of the self-assessment. The state verification um, is a verification of the CCB self-assessment. Um, so what that would be is us verifying the same um, IFSPs that you are self-assessing. Um, our hope in doing this is that it's also monitoring inner rate of reliability. So um, as an example, we've been working with Cohort 1, and they've been testing, and we've been getting their feedback on our self-assessment tool to look at are our ratings consistent. Um, be it a lower unacceptable rating or if we're at that best practice, we like to fall in a very narrow range that we're both, we're all able to evaluate quality um, of these ISSPs and outcomes. Um, and it's allowing us to analyze our ASSIP improvement strategies and progress toward improving outcomes for children. Okay, so um, I apologize for the technical difficulty. I think our, oh, oh, now we jumped ahead. Um, <laughs> but I want to kind of explain what's happening now. So as I said, we are implementing um, and looking at using our health assessment tool with implementing CCBs that are implementing Go For It. Um, so we are working currently with Cohort 1. Um, they have been engaged in testing the self assessment tool, uh, providing feedback, um, and we are then um, making adjustments and edits to our self assessment tool based on the feedback and the actual use for each of the CCBs in Cohort 1. Um, and we're identifying and getting approval for use of a web based form. So our initial tool, and I'll show you an example if I can get it to, that's where we're at now. <laughs> um, that we are have developed the self-assessment to, tool in an Excel um, fillable form, and I know I think the feedback from our communities has been that um, it's a it's a great tool, it's helpful, um, but it is a little bit cumbersome, and we would like to make this um, as easy and efficient for you to use um, as we bring communities on and using the self-assessment tool. Okay. No, but I, yes, we're there. Now. <laughs> Um, so what should you expect in the future as, you're, as you go for it and then um, you're in implementing community and we're at the point that we're doing self-assessment? Um, so the self-assessment requirements and um, how we determine these requirements was based on feedback from our communities, also looking at what we have in our assets. Um, and so initially the number of monthly self-assessments um, so we are starting with a monthly self-assessment as we're beginning this process to really give us more information about, um, because this is a new activity for us across the state, um, of looking um, directly on an ongoing basis 
I know that a lot of CCBs maybe have their own internal process for already looking at quality, um, but as a whole, um, this is a new expectation, and we like to do it more frequently, and then potentially in the future, as we have more information, um, look at modifying that. But initially, it's going to be um, very based on CCB size. Um, we do work with a data analyst that helps us pull um, our, our data and our numbers, and we are starting with a random sample, um, and it's looking like the larger CCBs may have an average <laughs> um, of 20 to 40 per month divided across um, either leads, supervisors, um, et cetera. I think we may, no, we didn't put the blank. Um, so ideally, we would like to have any, any person that may be overseeing other service coordinators um, using the self-assessment tool. I'm going to get to your question, Sue. Hold on to it. I see a lot of, a lot of question marks. Um, and then small to mid-sized CCBs are probably going to average about 1 to 10 self-assessments, so that's reviewing ISSPs per month, and that's also divided across either lead supervisors, and we also recognize that some CCBs um, might be all in the same one person. Um, so that's the, the initial self-assessment requirement. The state verif verification, the number of state verifications are also going to vary based on the number of total ISSPs that are being self-assessed. So what it looks like is we're actually pulling a sample of a sample. So the state would verify um, the, the same ISSP is a smaller amount that you would be self-assessing at, um, at the CCB level. So um, just to give you an idea, we've already pulled the numbers and we're going to start working on this once we make the modifications and edits to our self-assessment tool based on cohort one's feedback, is there's approximately, uh, approximately 95 um, ISSPs that need to be verified for the month of October um, here at the state. And those will be conducted about, um, across myself and Ashley Fernie, who is now um, in the role of evaluation coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this is um, work that we also collaborate with um, the program initiative unit in looking at the quality of these ISSPs. Um, so now, here we are. So just an overview of the development um, of the QIO, which was a quality ISSP outcomes assessment tool. Um, this name is an in progress. <laughs> we think if, if we have a better one, we, we will come up with that. Um, but we like it right now. Um, and this tool was actually developed based on the work of Naomi Youngren um, of the Educational Developmental Intervention Services at the Department of Defense. And it's adapted from a tool that exists in Kansas right now, and that's the Kansas Quality Indicator Rubric. And so there was a lot of great work in self-assessment and evaluation activities across um, the United States and different states, and um, we have adapted our tool based on um, an existing tool that we thought was um, a really great start for us. Um, so this is just a quick peek, an example um, of the, the, our first draft of our, our, our Excel assessment tool, um, and what it's looking at is, is different categories based on the spectrum, and you heard um, us say acceptable a lot. So we are um, doing this on a Likert scale of identifying quality rating statements that would fall into any um, of five categories, zero being not acceptable. So these are things that we would, we would not want to see in a quality ISSP. Um, we would have a rating of one, which is somewhat acceptable, two is acceptable. We have three, that's an emerging best practice, and four is a best practice. So right now we are looking at um, each of the components um, that would, we think that would um, show an ISSP's um, outcomes quality and because you heard a lot about threading, um, you are, I only showed the IFSC outcome section in our, in our um, print screen here, um, but we are looking at multiple areas that would affect the IFSC outcome. So we're looking at that family assessment. We are looking at the global outcomes and the IFSC outcomes themselves. And ideally, we'd be looking at each section to come up with an overall quality rating for any given IFSC. And this next um, picture is a, um, and a hopeful idea of what our a web form would look like. We do realize that um, everyone's on the go, and, and it might be easier to not have to access a physical form in an Excel-type document, and we're looking at drafting this, um, our second version, in a web-based format for you. So this may not be what the, our final document looks like, but it is an idea um, of what we're hoping um, to use as we push, push this out for you. Um, any questions? I know we're running over, so I, I want to um, we'll move on. If you do have any, you can always direct them. Direct them to me about the self-assessment tools. Um, 
We're really excited about this. It's, it's really, we believe, going to impact quality of IFSPs across the state because it gives you feedback in real time and very tangible feedback. So kudos to Amanda yeah. for working on this. We're so excited. I know it's not conveyed because you can't see our faces, but this is, this is a super exciting time. Um, so last we have just EI upcoming dates and a reminder. Um, so this is a reminder that October Indicator 1 and 8C are due Monday, December 5th, and that your reports are located in the Early Intervention CCD folder um, in the EI data system. Indicator 8A is due December 9th, also located um, in the report audit Indicator 8A. It's in the Indicator Reports for fiscal year 15-16. So remember, this is things that were already due, 15-16. These are um, highly, highly important that need to be um, finalized. Um, we also have bridge training office hours, and those are posted here on December 13th. And there's also an hour swinging into the new year, January 10th, um, 2017 is already here. And our next EI um, TA call is um, January 12th, and then just um, just a reminder, we are not going to be having our unicorn call, so if there are unicorn updates, they will be on that TA call. Um, and then a reminder that our state office holiday closures, uh, we will be closed on December 26th, um, on January 2nd, and again on January 16th. So we have a couple of closures coming up. And then our CICC quarterly meeting um, will be held on January 25th, and that will be at DDRC. So when I open it up, I know we're over, but if you do have any questions, go ahead and um, post them in the chat. I think the last time we tried to unmute everyone, we just got a lot of feedback and not any voices. All right, so I don't think we have any questions right now. All right, thank you so much for joining us on our call today, and we will... Talk with you next year. Bye. Bye. Bye.